Perfect. Well, I think um, we will go ahead and get started now that we have, I think, a, a nice core group. So welcome uh, to the Bentley Ware Book Museum's Virtual Coffee with a Curator program and happy Black History Month to everyone. Um, I wanna welcome all of the newcomers. If this is your first time attending our virtual program, thank you so much for coming and I really hope that you enjoy it. If you are one of our seasoned frequent members, thank you again for making time for this in your Wednesday morning. Um, I, I just really appreciate it. And I am so excited about today's program. I think it's going to be marvelous. In honor of Black History Month, we are once again going to activate the Bentley Rare Book Museum's collection of uh, very rich Harlem Renaissance materials and even going beyond the Harlem Renaissance because the writers that we're gonna talk about today weren't just Harlem Renaissance writers. So um, we're gonna kind of go beyond that as well. Today, we're gonna focus on two important writers of the Renaissance who also worked as librarians during their careers. And um, those figures are um, Arna Bontemps and Nella Larson. And um, I would love, uh, it's my pleasure uh, to welcome Charles Foster Jolivet, um, who's a board member of the Arna Bontemps Museum in Alexandria, Louisiana. And um, he's gonna be chatting with us a little bit today. I will, inf I will formally introduce him um, in just a minute. But first, for those of you who's been attending our programs, you know that we always start with our game, Where's Andrew? Andrew, uh, can you raise your hand for those who are new? Okay, Andrew just raised his hand. So uh, every time you have a program, Andrew changes his background to some kind of bookish place. And um, it usually aligns with the theme for the day. And it's our job to try and figure out where he is. Sometimes Andrew gives us clues, sometimes, you know, the clues are even more difficult, <laughs> even more difficult. We'll see. Andrew, is there anything that you want to tell us about today's location? It is a Carnegie Library. It narrows it down to around 3,000. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. It, like I said, Andrew's clues are sometimes questionable. <laughs> um, okay. So it's a Carnegie Library. Okay, um, and it has to do with the theme for, for today, as usual. Yes. Okay, so we try to not Google unless we have to, um, but let's start with, I don't know, does anyone have an, a state that they want to guess at first and narrow it down? New York. It is not New York, no. Um, Okay, can you, does it have more to do with Arna Bontemps or with Nella Larson? Arna Bontemps. Okay. Um, I'm assuming it's, well, okay. Um, is it in the South? Yes. Okay, it is in the, is it, is it in Louisiana? Yes, it is. Oh, it is? Oh, is it, so it's still there? Yes, it, it is, okay. Um, I'm gonna guess New Orleans. It is not New Orleans, no. Not New Orleans, probably not. That would be too easy. Um, is it a university? It is not actually, no. Oh. Baton um, Rouge? No. Battery. Hmm. I feel like I'm striking out here. Um, okay, Maggie, Lori, come on, <laughs> you heavy hitters. Help us out here. Uh, I'm actually furiously Googling right this minute. <laughs> Thanks. Andrew, is it a hard to pronounce city? Ooh. It is not, no. <laughs> that rules out quite a few. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I don't, because we it's not associated with a university, and so that's kind of hard. Um, I don't know. There is a very famous, well-known library that was in a city with the same name. Uh-oh. 
I don't do well under pressure. Andrew, is it Alexandria? Alexandria? It is. It is the Alexandria Public Library. Oh, um, I, I literally just found that on Google, <laughs> but I wasn't quick enough to say it. <laughs> well, we said it at the same time. <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. Okay. Well, that is exciting. I guess, again, I think this, it was throwing me off because I think I, you know, I think about public libraries and what I think that they're going to look like. And that wasn't what I thought. Um, how exciting. And um, as usual, Andrew always is, uh, goes the extra step and actually makes a full handout about the, the location for us. So he just dropped that in the chat. Thank you so much, Andrew, for stumping us once again. We really appreciate it. That was really good. Yeah, I just, I literally was not, I didn't have public library in my head. So I wasn't, I wasn't even thinking that. That's awesome. Um, yay. All right. So now um, we are going to move on to uh, the next segment of our of our program and I'm going to um, introduce our, our guest speaker um, and then we will kind of and then Charles however you want to handle this um, it can be more of a conversation it can be you talking and then you know however we want it to be so this is definitely a treat for us um, so I will introduce Charles to you all Charles Foster Jolivet is an author filmmaker and writing coach from San Francisco while residing in New Orleans, he has worked with and shared stages and stories with Dick Gregory, Paul Mooney, J. Cole, and other talents across industries. As a board member for the Arna Bontemps Museum in Alexandria, Louisiana, his goal is to broadcast, highlight, and engage multiple communities in order to share the impact and legacy of the museum's namesake. So welcome, Charles. We are so grateful to have you here with us. Um, and when I... Uh, uh, when I asked Charles to speak today, I kind of asked him to focus on kind of two main questions. Um, who was Arna Bontemps? And maybe also, Charles, you can tell us how to say his name properly, because that's the way I've heard it, but it might be different. Um, and then what is the Arna Bontemps Museum? And what is um, what do you all do? And um, what is the purpose of the museum? And what are some things that um, that you all do there? So however you'd like to structure this, Charles. And, and Absolutely. Also, if everyone could mute themselves um, while Charles is, you know, his main speaking, and then we can maybe we can ask questions and make it more of a conversation after that. Well, I like to say good day um, to everyone. Um, it's it's really a joy and a treat to be here um, on behalf of Arna and the museum and on behalf of the board of directors. Um, I'll kind of chat about uh, more of the museum in the latter half of this, and it'll be a brief presentation. I actually have a little bit of a PowerPoint, um, so I'm going to share the screen here. And y'all let me know if y'all can see that here in just a moment. Okay, great. Yep, you should be able to, you should have, oh, perfect. All right, there we go. Yep. All right, Arna Bontemps, or Bontemp, or Bontemps, really depends. It's a French last name, so people always, you know, do funny things with um, different last names. So um, Arna was born in Alexandria, which um, most people confuse Alexandria when they hear it for um, Virginia and not Louisiana. Uh, most people don't know much about central Louisiana. Um, and I think although Arna left when he was a kid, a part of his life, um, his work was to um, engage and highlight some of these southern small places. Um, he spent much of his life in the South. Um, but um, just to kind of go over some of the highlights of his career before I get into some of the, the other pieces I wanted to talk about. Um, he left uh, Alexandria as a child uh, when he was three or four years old um, because of obviously um, racial tensions in the South, like most um Black folks, um, uh, including my family, who left Louisiana as well um, when my father was nine and moved to California, um, a pretty popular uh, migration trek. Um, he left and went there. And as I mentioned, spent time all over. And I'll get into kind of that in a bit. But one of the things on this first slide, if y'all can see that I did want to highlight um, were a few of the places, um, as I mentioned, the South. Um, he did spend time, of course, in New York, and he is known um, um, for his impact on the Harlem Renaissance, which I'll touch on a little bit more in detail in a moment. Um, but um, obviously Huntsville, Alabama, he spent time there. He spent time in Chicago. He spent time, of course, at Fisk um, in Nashville. 
Um, so I'm going to kind of move forward. I did want to say first and foremost as well that, you know, for all the things that he was known for artistically, he was a father first um, and, a, and a husband. Um, and that family was very, very important to him. Um, and you'll see a, um, a few of few of those things in the slides here. So here are some of the places of impact that I sort of mentioned um, on his life and um, where he made um, made it a name for himself, uh, so to speak. He was not as popular, of course, in the Harlem Renaissance as um, someone like, of course, Langston Hughes. Um, but I'm going to also talk about um, what he had to do with Langston Hughes's uh, popularity. So central Louisiana, of course, um, his, his parents were from Natchitoches, which is the funny uh, sounding city that I thought Andrew was going to reference with the, uh, the library there. Um, but he got us on the easy one with Alexandria. So um, his, his folks were from up the road in Natchitoches, which is also considered central Louisiana, um, eventually went down to Alexandria, where he grew up for just a bit before moving uh, up to Southern California, um, and then eventually to Northern California, where he went to college. Um, and then, of course, we have Harlem, um, Chicago. He spent quite a bit of time there, Nashville and Huntsville, among some other places. Um, now, this quote at the bottom from Arna is interesting because he says, how dare anyone, parent, school teacher, or merely uh, literary critic tell me not to act colored or um, in today's state, African-American or black or Negro or what have you. And it's interesting because this actually comes from uh, something his father told him on the way to college. He said, don't go up there acting colored. Um, and he said, I don't know what that means. I'm going to be who I am. So he got his start, of course, as a poet. Um, he had great relationships uh, throughout his life. Um, he actually had his first poem uh, published in The Crisis, which is the uh, NAACP's uh, publication by W.B. Du Bois. Um, and then later he accepted a teaching position in New York, which is what got him over to Harlem. And he began to sort of build his relationships with folks like County Cullens or Neil Hurston, James Walden Johnson, and of course, Langston Hughes. And I love this, uh, this piece of a poem at the bottom here where he says, let us keep the dance of rain our fathers kept and tread our dreams beneath the jungle sky. So, so colorful, so imaginative. Um, I think that he was really ahead of his time. And it's a shame that more folks uh, kind of don't know um, about him. And that's kind of the job of the museum is to get more folks to kind of know about him and why he was so important. So this is early on. It actually shows here that the publishing was done in 42 on this book. I believe this is a reprint because the book was published in 32, if I'm not mistaken. So it's um, his first or I believe one of his first collaborations with Langston Hughes. Um, this is uh, Children of Haiti um, and the, the importance, I think, to, to think about this is in the 30s with all that racial tension, you know, at a, at a massive um, sort of level um, where he's talking about um, the diaspora in Africa and black folks and having sort of this this um, pride. Um, and I think that um, he worked really well with Langston because of that. Um, so here's some of his other work. Um, and I pulled some of these because they're all very different. There's another collaboration there, again, with his good friend Langston Hughes, boy on the of the border. Um, St. Louis Woman was actually adapted. It was a screenplay or a stage play that he um, had written. Um, and it's actually been uh, readapted several times on Broadway. It, this one actually featured uh, Pearl Bailey um, and, it, and it ran for quite a bit. Um, in New York, and then the story of the Negro. Um, he does a lot of work where he talks about um, other folks and a lot of um, uh, cataloging, almost like early library work um, before he actually got the job as a librarian uh, at Fisk. And so here, let me move that over. All right. Um, so here we have a photo, obviously, of, of Arna. And then in the foreground there is uh, the wonderful uh, Langston Hughes, who just celebrated a birthday um, just a few days ago. Um, and I shared this this uh, other piece of a poem here because of of a sort of a recurring theme in Arna's life, which is uh, like the sowing of seeds. Right. So I scattered seed enough to plant the land in rows from Canada to Mexico. But for my reaping, only what the hand can hold at once is all that I can show. Um, so this idea of always kind of uh, pouring into 
his work, his family, his people, um, and then waiting for that seed to sort of grow. Um, this this book here is actually uh, something that's available. I know Joy Ellen may have it. Um, I know that I'm looking to, to grab a copy, but there are letters. I believe there's over two or 3,000 uh, between uh, Arna and Langston in their lives. So it's kind of show you the closeness uh, in their relationship. Um, and then there's this uh, sort of idea and theme in his life of the power of Black relationshiphood. Um, this is a photograph, obviously, of him and uh, Sidney Poitier, who just recently passed right after Sidney had won um, his Oscar. And so, uh, again, a part of this idea of, of creating opportunities for other artists um, and having strong relationships with these other black men, which I think is really important um, and other black women as well. But something that um, that isn't talked about that we don't necessarily um, see as much of, um, today, I think, um, in some of this. So there's a brief, uh, letter, uh, from him to, uh, to Langston that's included in that book. And he talks about also sort of his career and his money. I think that, you know, there's a theme there too, where he, he speaks about never necessarily having a lot of money. Um, but I think that his, uh, his wealth was really his relationships, um, and what he poured into other people. Um, so, yeah. There's that. Um, and just a couple other really, really, really great um, photographs. In 46, he's there with um, the future president of FIS. Um, and they're looking over the Lincoln Bible um, in the school's library, which is um, pretty amazing. Uh, at the bottom there, there is Arna. And in the back there, um, Langston Hughes. Again, they're doing a book signing there in New York. And I have to say that the above picture from 39 is probably one of my favorite pictures. Um, of either of these gentlemen they're together and again the idea for arna especially um was that he was a father first and a family man first and a husband first and he made sure that he um, had that in the fore uh, forefront of his mind and his activities when he made decisions about where the family was moving and things like that so there's a picture of arna and four of the six kids and his wife alberta there with mr langston way back in 1939 um there he is. He's actually at a library, I believe, in Nashville reading to um, some kids. Um, and then that that, again, um, piece up at the top where he's talking about sowing. My brother's son are gathering stock and root, um, sowing seeds and pouring into other people. And so I think what's most important for me when I think about Arna is that he was a true catalyst and a curator for Black Pride. Um, and that was early. This was not in the 1960s that he was doing this. This was in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s um, before we had songs like I'm Black and I'm Proud. Um, I think he was one of those early people who was not afraid to um, to be what he was. Um, and so here is a really, really, really great letter between Arna, uh, or I should say um, uh, from Arna. Uh, to uh, Dr. Dubois and his wife. And I did want to share um, this and kind of read it over really quickly here. Um, it's from 1954. He was at Fisk at this time. He was the librarian. Uh, and he says, I thought you might be interested in the list of manuscripts, published works, and related items in the Charles Chestnut collection at Fisk. We have completed the cataloging of this collection. Scholars have been using it steadily in recent months, and we hope that the interest in Chestnut will continue. But here is the more important part for me. Uh, perhaps I need not to mention the 21 letters from Dr. Dubois, which the Chestnut Collection contains, but I would like to repeat to my former suggestion that I believe Fisk is the best place for the papers and books of W.E.B. And that I would give a pretty penny to bring them here. Now, remember, he is not uh, a wealthy man. He is you know, he's an educator. He's doing OK for himself. And he mentions in that letter to Langston that, you know, if my car doesn't break down and if things go right and if I can get this money and so on and so forth, I can do these other things like go and visit you and so on and so forth. But here he is um, sort of at the top of his career offering um, to highlight another black man. And I think that is very, very important, um, how much respect and admiration he had for um, WB was not his peer. He was obviously a few, quite a bit um, of years older than him. But um, this idea that he said, hey, listen, I'm working at this library and I know you you have some collections here, but I want you to bring that collection to and to a HBCU, to a black university. And um, I believe that a foundation, we can get them to pay handsomely to acquire that. So 
Um, I thought that was a really magical letter um, and kind of uh, a good central theme for what Arna was really about. Now, as we move towards sort of the end of this um, brief presentation, um, many people, again, don't really realize the impact that he had on Langston Hughes's life. They were best friends. Um, when Langston Hughes died, uh, Arna was actually named the executor, the co-executor of the estate. Um, and here is a printout um, from uh, from the article that was uh, published in Jet Magazine just a few days after uh, Langston had passed away and Arna was named the executor of the state. Um, there we go. And then here is Arna's uh, in the same Jet Magazine, or I should say in Jet Magazine, the same publication, um, the story of his passing. Um, and I'm not sure, you know, the the members, uh, a few of the members on the board are actually the, uh, the daughter-in-law of Arna. Um, and then uh, two or three of his grandchildren are on that board. So I'm not sure if there's accuracy in terms of this is saying essentially that he was at um, a wake of someone else when he had a heart attack. Um, other stories have it to where he was working at home on his um, autobiography, which has not been published um, when he passed away. But um, this is just um, to show that there was um, a good some admiration and respect for um, this scholar, this librarian, this person who was a first um, at, at plenty and many of things. So um, that publication. And then in terms of his legacy, and the Arnabon Thompson Museum. So you'll see on the far left there um, a image of the Arnabon Thompson Museum, which is his childhood home. It was relocated from its location in Alexandria um, to its present day location on a third street in Alexandria. So it's still in the city. Um, the museum is, um, or I should say was typically open for um, events. Um, we do a lot of work with youth, as you'll see on the far right there, the enrichment camp that happens uh, generally every summer. Um, and then the this is in uh, Nashville, the uh, sign, um, the placard for uh, Arnabon Thompson, his life. And um, interestingly enough, I have to talk to um, to uh, one of his uh, grandchildren. The um, There's also a, a street, Bon Tomps, in, uh, in Nashville, um, and I'm, I'm assuming that it was for Arna since he made such an impact there at Fisk. Um, yeah, and that is it. And that, um, again, our website is there, arnabontomps, uh, dot org. So um, if anyone has um, questions about the museum program, anything like that, you can reach out, of course, to that website. Um, Joy Ellen can give my information. I'm here to, um, if there's any questions, comments, um, yeah. But anyway, I do appreciate you all's time. That was amazing, Charles. Thank you so, so much. That was perfect. Um, and I wanted to just show because I, I couldn't help myself, you know, with your presentation. We do have um, a copy from 1932. You're exactly right. It is 1932 of Popo and Fifina. Um, love this one. And um, I wanted to show this, too, because this relates to something Charles said. This is um, sorry for the glare. Um, this is Black Misery that was um, Langston Hughes, I believe his final book that was published posthumously. Um, and it says in here, just as Charles said, has copyright in the text 1969. Um, and I believe Hughes died in, in 67, what we saw. Um, it said 1969 by Arna Bontemps and George Houston Bass as executors of the estate of Langston Hughes. So um, we see that right there. So thank you for, for showing that um, on your PowerPoint that connects directly to some things we have here. Um, and I wanted to open it up. I have some questions, but I want to first open it up to anyone else who has may have questions for Charles about um, some of you. Arna Bontemps might be someone you hadn't heard of before. So if you have a question about him or his life or about the museum and what they're up to now, please do ask Charles. If not, I have some questions. I can start us off. So my first, um, this isn't really a question. This is more of a, res a, res a comment, a response. Oh, Tamara has a really good question. Um, and I, I looked this up. Um, Tamara asked, so who holds Arna Bontemps' papers? Um, 
you can answer, Chuck. I think I might know. Well, that's a great question. It's, it's, I would actually say it's actually complicated. Oh. Um, much of his work is kind of dispersed. There is a, a family collection um, that we are sort of working to maybe implement into the museum for tours. Um, but it's sort of dispersed. One of the largest universities that has a collection is um, Syracuse. Um, has a huge collection. Yale actually has a collection, um, Chicago University, and of course, Fisk. Um, and there's some other um, uh, international um, locations that do have some uh, some of his works as well and some uh, yeah, some of the work. It's, it's, it's complicated. That's a great question. Um, yeah. But yeah, there's, there's um, you know, he has tons of publications, obviously, that you can um, still pick up and read, but yeah, there's, it's quite a complicated situation as it usually is with an artist that had some pretty serious esteem and he dies and families get involved and everything just kind of goes haywire. So. Hmm. I'm really glad you said that. Cause I actually thought his full collection was at Fisk. I didn't realize that it was, every, it was a lot. Of yeah. They have a large collection, but there's some other pieces that are sort of dispersed in other, um, pretty major universities as well. Oh, wow. Um, for those of you who um, love archives and would like to explore a little bit, um, you know, uh, Archive Grid is a great place to that can kind of pull together it, at least the, uh, the institutions that are represented in Archive Grid, but you can kind of see, you can put in Arna Bontemps in the search and kind of see where some of his papers are. And as Charles was saying, it might be a lot of places. And now that you mentioned that, Charles, that's interesting because I bet, yeah, Fisk does have a lot of things, but they might have things that have to do with maybe his career as a librarian there. Maybe they wouldn't have some other materials that people might, researchers might want to know about, about other parts of his life. Right. Yeah, that I, that makes sense. Um, I, I had a question. Oh, yes. Yes. Um, I thank you, Charles. I really enjoyed the presentation. Um, you had, I think you put up some quotes of some poetry that he had written. Does he have any poems published? I really enjoy poetry. I was just wondering, has is, is any of his poetry published? Yeah, so that's a great question. And thank you for having me. Um, actually, you know, and I kind of made sure to sort of focus on some of the larger scale things, but he was a poet first and foremost, before and ahead of anything else. That's what his... <laughs> Um, passion and desire was. And that's kind of how he got into the Harlem Renaissance. He was he was an educator in Harlem at the time and uh, Mount, uh, met County Cullen and W.E.B. and Langston and, and they all started to work. So he has a ton of poetry out there. Um, he does a lot of anthology work. He's covered a lot of other artists. Um, but yeah, if you if you put him in and you look through, uh, I guess Amazon is the best source nowadays for books. I'm not sure or other outside of the library. Um, yeah, he is a, a poet first and foremost. That's his, that was his, um, his, his goal and desire. And he knew that he wasn't necessarily going to, as most artists um, going to make a lot of money doing it. He was actually planning to go and get his PhD uh, and then got sort of turned into um, uh, and then not turned into, he became an, an educator and a professor and kind of worked with that um, instead of going back to get his PhD. So um, it, that is perfect. Um, yeah. I wanted to say also in the rare book museum, we have, uh, for example, this is American Negro poetry and it is an anthology edited by Arna Bontemps. And so, again, we see him being a, a librarian here. He was very good at making these anthologies, but he did include his, some of his own poetry in here as well because he was a, a poetic voice. So poems like A Black Man Talks of Reaping, Close Your Eyes, The Daybreakers, Golgotha is a Mountain, things like that. So he, and it's kind of cool because he edited this volume of poetry from, I think this one is the 1960s. Let me check. Yeah, 1963. So it's kind of cool to see which poems he, you know, for himself that he wanted to include in here. And he was the one who was editing it. So um, if you uh, contact us too, we can, uh, the Bentley, we can help you with finding some interesting editions of Bon Thompson's poetry. Um, Thank you. Of course. Any other questions? Um, well, a question I had uh, for Charles is, I know the pandemic has been really hard on museums and um, other cultural heritage institutions. Um, people like us, if we are in Alexandria, we're in Louisiana, can we come and visit the museum now? Um, yes and no. 
Um, <laughs> so um, with a with a building of its age um, and with just everything. Um, there's some, a little bit of work that needs to be done. Um, we're getting close to that point of, um, reopening. We've had a lot of, um, interest because of the virtual programming we've done for the last two years. Um, we should have something coming up in a month or so, and I'll let you know about that. So we do a lot of our, um, our work, um, virtual now. Um, Mm -hmm. but we are anticipating, um, at some point, uh, this year of opening it back up, um, and, you know, setting that up for tours and events. Um, and then we do have an outdoor space, um, that's sort of attached to the museum as well, where we can do things um, as well. So yeah, that would be fantastic. We, we would love to, uh, to be, get back to hosting um, in person. Yes. Wonderful. And we completely understand. I know it's, it's hard to know what to even say to that question, um, <laughs> but, uh, but we, we do know, at least we have you as a context so we, we can always ask and, and um, kind of see. And, uh, and I, I love this partnership. So we'll, we'll definitely continue that. Um, well, thank you so much, Charles. I would love for you to stay for the next 30 minutes of the program, but if you have to go, we completely understand. So Raylan, can um, I ask one quick question oh, before we go on? Yes, Is that yes. okay? Okay. Um, I, I just want to ask, you know, as sort of a, maybe a, a spokesperson for Arna Bontemps, um, I, I, you mentioned a comment that, that I think one of the things that, that you found um, interesting or, or helpful in, in researching his life is the connection among um, Black men at that time. What are some other, what would you say are the, are the lessons or sort of what, what does Arna bring to the conversations today and, and why is he important for us to um, know and and uh, appreciate today. What what are, what are the lessons that he has to teach us? Wow, um, to be authentic, no matter what you are. Um, he was, I mean, he was really fearless, and I'm, I know that that's sometimes used for people who are um, well known or famous or um, publicized. But he was really fearless to be talking um, with such pride and tenacity and um, respect for his, um, for himself, for his family, for his race at a time where, um, you know, folks were being lynched in the street for, for looking at someone a certain way or for looking at all, for whistling at a woman um, and for him to show the pride that he did in his works. And you'll see that. And I know that, you know, as you know, you said, you're someone who, who's familiar with his work, um, but for folks who are not, if you just kind of read through just a few of his poems or some of the, the titles of some of his works, um, he was very um, proud um, and authentic and not to um, disparage anyone else, um, but to have pride when um, it was a dangerous thing to have. So I think that would be a primary lesson from his life is, um, you know, be rooted in, in your core and whatever that is, if it's family, if it's religion, if it's all those things, be that. Um, but um, be authentic to that. And, you know, you know, people sometimes chase, you know, chasing money and chasing highlights and all this. He, he didn't care about any of that stuff. He just wanted to be what he was, which was an artist and a family man and have these great relationships with um, with his people. Uh, recommendations for um, books. Um, oh my goodness! Um, well, what's this uh, one? Black Thunder. Yes, that's right, Black Thunder. And thankfully, we're gonna. I'm gonna show some that we have in our collection, so um, that might be helpful too. Um, I noticed that Charles also put on his slideshow "Story of the Negro." That one is very, very important um, because that one won the new bear or. It didn't win, but it was a Newbery Honor Award book, um, and he was the first Black man to receive that. And um, I think that one might be, I noticed that Charles had that on, on his slideshow, but um, yeah, any others you can think of, Charles, feel free. Um, you can put there's it in the chat. It's yeah, so many. <laughs> there's so many. Just, I mean, realistically, I would I would put them in and, and just grab anything. Um, yeah. There you go. He was, uh, he was yeah, he was a sincere genius. Thank you. Absolutely. Yes, he absolutely was. And um, one thing that I've I have so much respect for him anyway, but I gained even more respect when I saw that piece of correspondence to Dubois, and he wasn't afraid to be like, I think his paper should come here. Right, <laughs> and an yeah, I'm like, I loved that. <laughs> Yeah, that's what I was mentioning. You know, it wasn't like Dubois was his peer. It was more like a father figure. He was much older than them. So for him to, he was uh, pretty bold. Bring that paper to Fisk. We need it. 
We need it. Exactly. I love that. Um, so thank you again, Charles. And um, uh, we're going to talk now a little bit about Nella Larson, who um, Arna Bontemps, I'm sure, would have um, known um, or, of course, known of. Um, but Nella was a Harlem Renaissance writer, but she was a little bit different. Um, while Arna Bontemps had a very long legacy and was a writer, educator, um, a, a very proud family man, and then had a long, long career as a librarian at Fisk. Um, Nella Larson was, she, she peaked at the um, end of the 1920s with her writing, became quite popular, was lauded by people like W.E.B. Du Bois, but then she disappeared into what at the time people called kind of an obscurity and was later revived. So I did a bit of a different story, but what many people don't know is that she also spent time as a librarian in Harlem. So um, a little bit about Nella Larson. She was born actually Nellie Walker in 1891 to a Danish mother and a West Indian father. Um, her white mother later married a, a white man, I believe a, a, a Danish man, and then they had a daughter. So um, she had to tread America's strict color line um, differently than her family um, because there were, you know, there were three white people in the family. And then there was Nella, who was darker skinned because she was um, of mixed race. So she but she was also never completely at home with the black middle class either, um, as this community had its own hierarchies and rules and traditions. And they didn't really that often didn't mesh with Nella's more liberal views and um, her, con her kind of connection to the international world through her heritage. So um, she, she did, and actually it was interesting, she actually studied at Fisk University in Nashville, but then she ended up leaving because she didn't, um, she kind of refused to um, accept the school's more like Southern conservatism um, regarding gender and other social issues. So she moved to Denmark for some years and lived with her mother's family. And she actually studied at um, the Lincoln Hospital and Home in the Bronx for nursing. So she did, and she excelled in nursing. Um, she went to Tuskegee and served as a nurse, but then didn't like, again, same issue with kind of the Southern, she felt a little suffocated by some of the rules there. So she didn't like that. So she went back to New York. Um, she married a scientist a, a named Elmer Imes in May 1919, and um, through him, she began kind of running with Harlem's elite um, upper black um, upper class, including W.E.B. Du Bois, Jesse Fawcett, James Weldon Johnson, etc. And she frequented a lot of events at the 135th um, branch of the New York Public Library. That was the Harlem branch. So she was going to these events, and the, that branch of the library was a touchstone of the Harlem Renaissance. And um, those rich African-American collections ended up becoming what we now know of as the Schomburg Center for um, the Schomburg Center for Research and Black Culture. So when Nella Larson, when she was, I think she was involved in one of the main exhibitions that they had in 1925, and she was later encouraged um, to um, work at the library. So she um, was actually the first um, I believe she was the first Black woman admitted to the New York Public Library's training school. And she eventually became the head of the children's division of the 135th branch of the New York Public Library. And it's around this time when she was a librarian that she really started to um, come into her own as a writer. Um, she had written some short stories earlier in the earlier 1920s, but when she was a librarian, she started doing some more writing. And then by the late 1920s, that's when she published her two novels um, that she is uh, most famous for called Quicksand and Passing. Some of us may know of Passing, especially since it was recently made into a Netflix film just last year. Um, and Nella Larson's archives can be found at several places. There's really not that much about her. Um, whereas Arna Bontemps, there's quite a lot about him. Um, there's not as much um, about uh, Nella Larson, but you can find some archives at the New York Public Library and at the Beinecke um, um, uh, Library at Yale. 
Um, so we're talking about two very different um, writers and librarians, and uh, but they both made immeasurable contributions to the Harlem Renaissance, and many of their works have been revived um, in, in later times and um, still resonate, actually. So I'm going to show um, a, a few... Um, and, and yes, if people have to go, I completely understand. Thank you so much for coming, Madeline. Um, so I'm going to show a few pieces from the Bentley Rare Book Museum's collections that, that we have for Arnold Bontemps and Nella Larson. We have a lot. Um, we're still growing the collection, but I think y'all will be interested to see this. So um, I'm going to go ahead and share. And this is just a bunch of pictures that I want to show you all. Um, hopefully this will work. So um, we've seen a picture of Arna Bontemps, but if you haven't seen Nella Larson, she's on the right here. Um, so just in case y'all hadn't seen her. Okay, so I'm gonna start with some pieces that we have written by Arna Bontemps. So this is just a sample. Um, I wasn't able to include all the text we have um, just because, just for time's sake, but there are quite a few. For example, Arna Bontemps co-wrote um, and co-edited uh, books with Jack Conroy and with Langston Hughes, and I wasn't even able to include all of those, but these are just kind of a, a few books that we have, um, a few first and early editions of books written by Arna Bontemps. So this is, um, I had mentioned on the left, Story of the Negro. Um, this is a first edition, first printing. And this one I absolutely love because again, um, this is the first book by an African-American to become a Newbery honor book. And it's one thing, I, a theme I noticed about Arna Bontemps is he was very passionate about making sure that African-American children and children of color had literature and texts that told the story of their people in a way that was that was true and authentic and did not, you know, begin with slavery. He wanted to make sure that children of color had empowering books about their history. Um, and this is one of those examples. And I love it because the dust jacket, and that's another thing I always say, if you have a book with a dust jacket, be sure to keep that dust jacket on because it increases the value of your book. And then also there are some pieces of bibliographic information that you can only find on the dust jacket. On the dust jacket of Story of the Negro, we have a um, kind of a testimonial from Arthur Spingarn, who was the president of the NAACP at that time. And he included um, a, a quote of praise for this book on the dust jacket, which is exciting. In addition, um, the book is dedicated to Langston Hughes, and we learn from Charles the deep connection between Arna Bontemps and Langston Hughes. And Arna Bontemps chose as the epigraph for this book, an epigraph being kind of the, the poem that kind of sets the stage, it sets it off. He chose Langston Hughes's very famous poem, The Negro Speaks of Rivers. Um, so it's it's a, just a wonderful text altogether, and illust it's illustrated as well by Raymond Lufkin. So just so many different things. On the right here, this text we have tomorrow was published in 1945. And excuse me, I forgot to mention that Story of the Negro was published in 48. But we have tomorrow highlights um, 12 African Americans that are excelling in fields previously off limits to Black Americans, like in advertising, working in public health, conducting a symphony orchestra. So many of these Black folks that are um, outlined in this book, people haven't heard of, but they are doing incredible work. And Arna Bontemps wanted to highlight um, Black people that aren't famous, but that are doing um, incredible things. Um, these are two poetry anthologies. Um, as I said earlier, American Negro Poetry was published in 1963. This is a, we've got a, this is a 15th printing, so it's a later printing. Um, but it is a beautiful collection of poetry um, that Arda Bontemps edited and put together. Again, we see his librarianship work coming out here. Um, and then he also did that for children. We see Golden Slippers, an anthology of Negro poetry for young readers compiled by Arna Bontemps. And this is just beautiful. It's, um, it's illustrated by a woman, which I love. 
Um, it includes poetry by Black writers spanning several decades, and it has a treasure trove of bibliographic information in the acknowledgement sections saying where pieces were first published. It also includes biographies of these writers. So this was really a text that was meant to teach young people. Um, Chariot in the Sky, um, this is an example of Arnaud Bontemps writing a historical novel. So this is a story of the Fisk universities or famous Jubilee singers that were founded um, in uh, the late 19th century. And this particular, um, so it's a novel based on their history. And this particular copy, we look, we see on the right, it has an inscription. So when an, when the, an author writes a note to someone and signs it, it's called an inscription. And it says, for Harry Belafonte, a souvenir of his first visit to Fisk with high esteem, Arna Bontemps, April 28, 1966. Um, this book was originally published in 1951, but this printing is from 1965. And this is clearly a, a copy that he had for Harry Belafonte, um, the famous Black singer, actor, and activist. So it's very interesting. We see someone, fam another famous person that Arna Bontemps met. These are two other historical novels that are about um, slave insurrections, um, um, Black Thunder and Drums at Dusk. So we see that, um, again, Arnaud Bontemps was a poet, but he was also a wonderful historical novelist. Um, these are some more pieces for children, Lonesome Boy. Um, I love the illustrations in on Lonesome Boy. This is, I, I, don't, I don't know the exact technique, but this kind of looks like pen, but a beautiful scribble. I love that. And then um, as Charles showed us, Popo and Fifina, we have a first edition um, that he uh, co-authored with Langston Hughes and it has beautiful um, illustrations that look like, I believe they're from woodblocks, um, woodcut illustrations. So that is just gorgeous. Um, next, um, I'm gonna move on to some pieces we have by Nella Larson. Um, Nella Larson, I'm, I'm going to focus on her novel Passing because that's something that I've been studying lately. And we have eight editions of Nella Larson's novel Passing in our collection. She is most famous for her novels Quicksand, published in 1928, and then Passing the following year in 1929. They both have similar themes that talk about um, light-skinned African-American women that are so light that they are able to pass and people um, and to pass as white. And um, Larson talks about that kind of racial complexity. That is something that Nella Larson um, would have been something that she knew of because she was of mixed race and was uh, light-skinned. So that idea of revealing and uh, race as a social construction was something that she dealt with. It was a topic that many people didn't deal with at the time, and she did. So again, we've got eight editions of her novel Passing that cover, well, sort of nine decades, kind of. We see this first one. This is a uh, copyright 1929 by Alfred A. Knopf, um, but this is a reprint edition. You see this little tiny um, area here that says reprint 1985. It is really, really hard to get first printings of Nella Larson's novel Passing. I am currently in an investigation to find one and to figure out why it's so difficult to get them. I have some leads, but I've reached out to rare book librarians, um, curators of African-American collections. I've reached out to a couple booksellers. I'm going to find out why it's so hard because now that interests me. Did it have to do with the print run? Did it have to do with her text? Um, did people, it was, it was well received by some, but was it because of the themes? There weren't many printings. I don't know. But for now, we have to settle for a reprint edition. But we don't have to only get just the reprint. Passing has been published in later years. And this is one of the really important editions. This is from 1986. Um, and this is the edition edited by Deborah McDowell. And the reason why this is important is because McDowell's edition helped bring Nella Larson's two major works back into the public eye. And like pro and prompted a renewed um, interest in them. Deborah McDowell was also one of the first scholars to um, illuminate um, the theme of a lesbian relationship that took place in passing. Many other scholars didn't really interpret it that way, but McDowell did. And so 
that was um, kind of a new way of looking at the novel as well by focusing less on race and more on also um, a love between two women. This is another edition. It's a later edition from 1992, the collected fiction of Nella Larson. So this one not only includes her two novels, but also some of the short stories that she published that many people don't know about. This one, I believe, is from 1997. And this edition is interesting because um, for its cover, it uses a painting by Archibald Motley called The Octoroon Girl. Octoroon, um, and this, this painting is from 1925. Octoroon is a term that we no longer use. Um, we would consider it derogatory now, but it refers to someone who has one eighth um, African American heritage. This is an edition that I love for another reason. Um, this is from 2000 it, because it includes an, an introduction by Entezake Shange. Um, for those of you who may not have heard of Entezake Shange, but she um, is really well known for her play called For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Is Enough. So if you've heard of the, you know, or even if you've seen the movie Colored Girls, it's based on her play. So Entezake Shange was a name or is a name in, liter in Black literature and Black women literature. So having an introduction by her um, for this book, again, provides another, um, it kind of brings the, the book into prominence again. Um, again, we see another, re the complete fiction of Noah Larson. So this is from 2001. So it's being printed again. We see, uh, this is again, a new cover, but from 2002, um, this also includes the introduction by Entezake Shange and then a critical forward and notes by May Henderson. So we see this is, we're seeing multiple printings. This is happening and people are including different things in them. Again, from 2004. So um, as you can see, these multiple printings, they tell us things. They tell us that um, Nella Larson, although people would have said that she faded into obscurity, we see that she was revived in the 80s and then she was continuing to be in print. People know of her a little more now, again, because of the Netflix film that came out about passing. So it's interesting to see how we can revive writers or how sometimes what they write about, depending on what happens during in the world, sometimes their writing becomes, resonates and becomes more relevant again. Um, so it kind of goes in cycles. Um, so even though there's not a lot known about Nella Larson, um, we are collecting um, a lot on her work and trying to find out more about her and especially with regards to her novel passing as that has been something that's been talked about a lot lately. So, I have a question, Joy Allen. Yes. Um, you mentioned having the, I think you said eight copies of Nella Larson's passing. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering how that came to be. Were those acquisitions over time or donations? How did it come to be that the Bentley has the eight copies or were they acquired all at once? Just wondering. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, they were actually pretty much acquired all at once. So we acquired them back in, it was a few years ago, but it was actually uh, Mr. Williams um, had the foresight to uh, acquire, make this a collection because we were developing our Harlem Renaissance collection. And the thing about Harlem Renaissance pieces is that as Charles was kind of showing in the, um, when he talked about like Arna Bontemps, his first writings were in the Crisis magazine. A lot of Harlem Renaissance material, when it was first published, they were published in magazines or in journals and whatnot. So, um, and then the first edition books are often really hard to get as well because they're very prized. Um, but Nella Larson is one that, again, people don't know a lot about her. And um, we wanted to expand our Harlem Renaissance collection beyond just the people that like everyone may know, like Langston Hughes and Zora Neale Hurston. Um, so uh, Mr. Williams made it a point to do that. And then also um, our previous curator was going to do an exhibition about Nella Larson. So they all were kind of acquired at the same time. And the copies that I showed you are not rare copies. Um, they are things that you all can get on and you know Amazon, Abe Books, other book platforms. And again, I mentioned why it's hard to get rare editions of Noah Larson, but they are things that um, anybody can acquire. Thank you. 
Mm -hmm. Any comments or questions? Um, one thing I wanted to mention, and um, Maggie knows about this because Maggie is doing this with her collection. Sometimes people might wonder, why do you acquire like eight copies of the same book? Why would you acquire the same book over and over again? But as you can see with the passing example, um, yes, we are acquiring the same general story, but the fact that it was printed many different times, each of those editions helps us understand the journey that passing has taken in our society and helps us understand, um, you know, each edition has its own, maybe its own differences and has um, paratextual elements that are different. So it helps us see um, the trajectory of passing in, in American history and helps us to understand how peep different folks interpret it. Um, some of them have were made for, for study groups. Other of them were made for um, people that are learning. Some of them are in different languages. Some might include, again, a, an introduction by Entezake Shange. It's like, oh, I didn't know she had something to say about the book, but she did. Yeah, something that's been really fun for me, collecting all the different editions and versions of Frankenstein, the ones that are the most fun for me so far are like the young adult or, or children's editions to get school age children in classrooms, like reading. It's like a kind of like a graphic novel or made to be like a, a, a character from a TV show, Wishbone. I mean, that's one of my favorites when I was little, the Wishbone, the dog. Mm -hmm. He he does the Frankenstein book and it's those are the most fun for me. Exactly. So things you would have never even considered um, that would be a part of the copy have become a part of it. And um, different companies, publishers, people have taken it on and have tried to put their spin on it. So it's it's really exciting to collect different editions of the same book. And then sometimes you do find the story sometimes changes a bit, um, especially when you see a, a graphic adaptation, right? That's they have to change. Yeah. And a lot of times the ones that are written for for younger audiences yeah. are an adaptation adaptation mm -hmm. of the story so that uses everyday words instead of Mary she uh, Mary Shelley vocabulary <laughs> exactly exactly so it, it's really fun to collect one um you know one book but se several editions so and really informative as well Steph okay I have a I have a um, a comment, but it's, it doesn't have anything to do with the book, but I heard you talking about Fisk University. So I thought it was just an interesting thing to tell you. So I'm a huge college gymnastics fan. I've been for many, many years. I um, have season tickets for UGA gymnastics and Fisk University just announced that they will be the first HBCU to have a women's collegiate um, gymnastics team. And they'll be starting next year. It's oh, never happened before. Goodness, that is amazing. Well, honestly, when you said gymnastics and Fisk, I was like, I wonder where Stephanie's going with this because like you never hear about that. That is amazing. Yes. So they'll be starting in uh, January of 2023. Um, they'll have, you know, I don't know what, which conference they'll be part of and, um, you know, how their whole scholarship situation will work, but it'll, it'll be whatever the NCAA rules are, mm -hmm. but they will have a co women's college gymnastics uh, team. They're the only HBCU and they'll be the first one to have ever done it. That is incredible. How exciting is HBCUs yes. making moves? I love yes. it. I love it. Um, that is awesome. Thank you for that. I would have never known that. Um, <laughs> that's so exciting. And both Arna Bontemps and Nell Larson had connections to Fisk. So <laughs> that's what made me remember it. I was like, oh, I have to tell. Yeah, that is great. Um, and I also just want to pop in to remind you that there is a black coffee giveaway raffle. Yes. Thank you. Maggie is my, Maggie has to remind me because I always advertise we're having a giveaway and then I'm like, okay, bye everybody. <laughs> I forget that we have our giveaway. Yay. So everyone, just by attending, your name has been put into um, our little uh, giveaway uh, pool. So Black Coffee, our partner, has, has offered to give someone a bag of coffee um, if, they, uh, if they win. So Maggie, and, and if you don't like coffee and you end up winning and you want to maybe pass it on to somebody else, um, that's fine. But hopefully you do. Um, Maggie, do you have a winner uh, that has been selected? Uh, yes, yeah, so by my very official method of eeny, meeny, miny, mo, and the people who have attended today, the winner is Tatiana Riss. 
Yay, Tatiana, congratulations. And I think this is Tatiana's first time attending. <laughs> It is. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. I'm so glad. Well, Tatiana, I will connect with you and we'll get your coffee order in because um, Black Coffee has a variety of gourmet organic coffee beans that you can select from. Um, so that's so awesome. Exciting. Yay. I'm so excited. Um, and uh, before we go, I wanted to mention that Christian put in a wonderful comment in the chat um, that books can change drastically through the editing process, sometimes between versions, which you can also track through multiple reprintings. Um, and I, he said, I remember I, um, a class he took into multiple copies and trying to track these changes, sometimes overt, sometimes not. Thank you, Christian. Another reason why it's important to collect um, sometimes the same book, but several editions. So uh, wonderful. Thank you for that comment, Christian. So, yay. Well, this has been a wonderful time. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you for um, uh, celebrating Black History Month with us. Um, our next program is going to take place on March 23rd. And we are going to be talking about several women writers in our collection. And it's going to be really, really fun. Um, and I, I think that y'all are going to enjoy it very much. Um, I did want y'all to know that if you are interested um, at the KSU Center next week, so you don't, so that's, that's a little bit off campus where parking is really great. Um, I'm going to have, yes, it's this building that Stephanie's in um, where Ollie is as well. Um, I'm going to be hosting an event about Nella Larson's passing, and I'm going to have Dr. Griselda Thomas from KSU, an English professor. We're going to, we're going to talk about it. We're going to see a couple clips from the film, and we're going to talk about the additions that we have here in the Bentley more in depth. So that's going to be on February 22nd at three o'clock PM. That's Tuesday, February 22nd at three o'clock PM. Um, if you are interested, please just let me know. And I will send you more information um, about the location and, and the building that it's in. So anyway, if you're interested in that, again, just let me know. And I look forward to seeing everyone uh, soon. All right. Bye, everybody. Take care. So glad y'all enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Bye.